Toledo United Methodist Church on this first Sunday of November. My name is Steve Wired, and I welcome friends who are local and those who may be uh, in other places, near or far. You're all a part of a community, and we connect with one another through technology, which is rather amazing in the times in which we live. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're with us today and, and, uh, and in this way and in spirit as well. I must say to you that if, uh, if I'm a bit non-traditional in dress, it's because uh, we woke up to snow this morning. And I'm taping this uh, on Friday morning, and we've got snow in Taos and in the Ski Valley as well. So uh, most folks in New Mexico are happy with moisture, and we, we celebrate that as well. Uh, I just want to, on behalf of Sherry and, and, and the Ed Council and everybody, uh, we want to thank you for your continued support of El Pablito uh, and also the shared table. Uh, you know, people, people get hungry and have needs throughout the year. It's not just uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, and it's not just Sunday mornings. So uh, your support of our little church is much appreciated, and we thank you for that. <clears throat> this morning, I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to open with some scripture from the Gospel of Luke, from chapter 10, and I'm reading from the message this morning, which is a contemporary paraphrase by Eugene Peterson. It's, uh, it, it's a parable, it's a story that you've heard before, no doubt, um, so hear these words perhaps with new ears. Just then, a religious scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? He answered, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? He said that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence, and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, said Jesus. Do this and you shall live. Looking for a loophole, he asked Jesus, and just how would you define neighbor? <clears throat> Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. And then a Levite, a religious man, showed up, and he also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came upon him, and when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. And then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him, and if it shall cost any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by the robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religion scholar responded. Jesus said, go and do the same. May God add a blessing and a reading to those words. Amen. I want to ask you to think about, uh, I want you to think about parables. I don't know how many parables you know or which are your favorites. But parables are stories, and Jesus told a lot of parables, and the, and the book of Luke is, is, is filled with parables. The story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, <coughs> the lost son. Jesus lived in a time when there, were, there was nothing like we have today in terms of communication. So people told stories. Oral history was, was very important. And they passed these stories on from one to another. 
in crowds of people who would gather. And the story and the parable was a way to get a point across. And the words we heard from Luke this morning, chapter 10, speak about what I think is probably one of the most famous and, and best known parables. There are people who know about this parable who don't even do church. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. When I was in the legislature years ago in Kansas, we, we passed a Good Samaritan law. We used that title. It was a Good Samaritan law that if you stopped to help someone, you weren't liable for what might happen. It's a way to invoke the biblical stories and the parables of old into present day times. And it's it's a story that has been told and retold, and I think it's one of the favorites, and one that people remember because they understand it. They get it. And that doesn't mean we have to stop for every person along the road. We have to use our common sense in terms of what, what is being asked of us and what we can do. But the story resonates with people around the world. The priest, the Levite, those who made the stop and looked and said, not me, I'm going on. It was the Samaritan who was traveling that road to Jericho. I've been to Jericho. I've been to the Middle East three times. I've traveled in Israel, Palestine, the West Bank. And I remember going to Jericho, one of the oldest, some say the oldest city in the world. And to think about what it means to answer the question, who is my neighbor? Who am I obligated to help and why? It's not an easy question to answer, I admit that. But you know, the faith, the Christian faith doesn't call us to run away from difficult questions. It causes us and challenges us to face and confront difficult questions and circumstances. And that was true 2,000 years ago. It's true today. Whether we live in Taos, New Mexico, whether we live in Europe and North Africa, whether we live in South America, Guatemala, it doesn't matter. The challenges of the faith are always there before us. And we're called to confront them and not run away from them. And each of us do that in our own way. To answer that question, who is my neighbor? You know, there's a lot of people in the wintertime, especially in towns. Of course, we have snow today. We have snow on the mountain and, and we have snow in town. And there are people out on the street corners with signs, cardboard signs, saying, uh, need food, money, help. I don't give money. I don't give any cash out to people. But I do stop and tell them about shared table and tell them that we can help them with food and some basic needs. And let them know that. And I also, and this reminds me, I also usually try to carry in, in, in my Jeep somewhere, have some socks, clean socks, and energy bars. And I can give somebody a clean pair of socks or an energy bar rather than a five dollar bill or a ten. Say, here's some warm socks, here's an energy bar. Be well. And they appreciate that. There's many different ways we can respond to the question about who is my neighbor. And then when we answer the question, what do we do about that? Do you remember the television show that was on for years? <coughs> I think it was on for over 30 years. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Fred Rogers. Who is my neighbor? And he asked the question, will you be my neighbor? He used to kind of sing that. I, I'm not going to... I'm not going to sing to you this morning. Uh, my hope is to gather people, not to turn them away. <laughs> but he used to sing that. Will you be my neighbor? And Fred Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian minister, uh, as well as a television producer and author. 
And he tried to connect with children, and he tried to connect with them in ways that would help them identify who their neighbor is. And in this age of, of immigrants, immigration policies, divisive issues, political issues, there also are the theological issues. And they, they weave a tapestry through that as well. So don't, don't try to totally disconnect the two. I think we're called to live our faith in a way that integrates our faith and who we are with the realities in which we live. And there's many ways we can try to do that. A few years ago, I was in Guatemala for a couple of weeks uh, with a group of people, uh, my friend Mark from Salida, Colorado and others and we were helping people there uh, with housing needs and education and schools and I remember distinctly one family that we visited uh, a man and his wife and they had their four children and they welcomed us into their their humble home and I think about that family when I think about those who come north for a better life and what I would do with my children if, if I needed them to have a better life and better safety. Trying to deal with the question of who my neighbor is is important. Years ago, Vincent Van Gogh, who is, uh, whose life is, is very interesting to me and someone I admire, Vincent did a painting of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And it, it, it's, it's a beautiful painting. And, and I remember being in Amsterdam and being able to see so many of his original paintings at the Van Gogh Museum. He painted it well. He brought home to us the meaning, I think, of what the Good Samaritan parable is about. And Vincent was someone who who wanted to be a minister, he wanted to be a pastor and a preacher. But the hierarchy of the church in his day, for, for reasons we don't fully understand, said, no, Vincent, we don't think you're, you're ready or worthy to be a pastor. And he was involved in the Methodist church, believe it or not, at that time. And he finally said, if you won't let me preach to these people, then I'm going to go out and paint them. So he went out and painted the potato eaters and the miners. Because he said, these people are my neighbors. I want to paint them. I want to reach out to them. I want to embrace them. That's what the church strives to do. That's what Shared Table strives to do. On the second and fourth Wednesday, every month, all year long. And the volunteers and the work that Sherry's done and the work that the board has done for over 25 years has made a difference. And we never know when we're called to step into that role. I would share with you, a couple of years ago I was in Santa Fe. I was, uh, I was eating on Cerritos at a restaurant called The Pantry. <coughs> it's a nice restaurant, been there since 1948. As I left the restaurant, I came out of the, the pantry, and Cerrillo, some of you may know, is a very busy street in Santa Fe. And there was a disabled person who, who walked up to the curb and, and was preparing to cross this very busy street. And there was no stop sign there to push a button for traffic. It was, it was going to be very risky for him, and I... I uh, I decided it was time for me to help him out, and so I went over to him, spoke to him, and, uh, and as best we could communicate with one another, I took his arm and I put my hand out and asked the traffic to stop. And he couldn't walk very fast, so we just slowly, slowly, step by step, crossed the street. And I want to say to you, there were people who began to honk their horns. 
not in anger or frustration or impatience, but they were just supporting the fact that 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 this 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 person was getting some help. I just happened to be there. Could have been you. And they all waited till we crossed the street. And as they drove by, they waved, they honked again, and, and, and it was very rewarding. That helps me answer the question of who is my neighbor? And how can you and I be a good Samaritan in the times in which we live, in the times we're called upon? And we don't always know when that's going to happen. It's just a part of a daily occurrence in life. So I challenge you this month in November to give thought to what that means, what that parable means to you, and how you can reach out to others, as Jesus reached out to so many people. There's no question he was there. He was there to help them and to be with them. Go and do likewise, he said. Be a neighbor. Be a good, a good Samaritan to those along the way. And that can make all the difference in somebody's life. And you can set an example. It can be a ripple effect. I really believe in that. A ripple effect that goes on and on and on. God help you to do that. And may God help all of us to do it. Amen. Holy God, be with us this day and every day. Whether we live close in miles or far away, let us be close in spirit and know that you walk with us that we never walk alone. Help us to come to terms with the question of who our neighbor is and then challenge us to move forward and take action that can be a benefit to others. Jesus was there for so many. May the church, may us as individuals try to do the same. And that spirit we gather together in church and go about our lives but as we leave the service, may we take that inspiration and that hope with us to be there for others as he was there for us. Amen.